Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our crypto fans. You have your hosts in chief, Robert Ridzak, Carlos Indejas, and Matt Reed here for a sunrise session of the Deep Cast. No sunrise in New York City, though, guys. It's pretty, uh, pretty muggy and murky out there. But luckily, I have. Pitch black. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, I have my Yeti Deep Q Digital mug here with uh, caffeinated yes. beverages, allowing me to stay caffeinated. Then I have my Deep Q. You can't really see it, but Deep Q Digital glass, <laughs> you know, with water in order to keep me a little hydrated. And then my favorite. Carrot juice reminds me of my younger days when I was growing up as a kid. So a little, a little comforting. I got I'm all beveraged out, guys. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm I just feel like a I feel like a popper over here with just just coffee. <laughs> You're like a boomer. Yeah, not cool. And you, and you have the deep Q t shirt on, Rob. You really uh Yeah, yeah. yeah I was like I, I, I am totally it's, flagged out today. I have deep Q digital shaved on the back of my head too, so but I can't show it because <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe next time. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, that, what you that got? probably costs that costs extra at the barbershop, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, they pay me to do it. <laughs> like learning, they're learning. They must be. They must be yeah. fans of the show. Yeah, they misspelled deep. It's spelled D E A P. Diop, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Matt, what are you drinking today, man? You have water again? Exactly. Dude, In the morning, can't be I... anything other. I'm actually impressed. Uh, you know, it's like I go like it's literally like I wake up, I do nothing else but I walk to the kitchen and I make myself a cup of coffee. It's like autopilot. So no, I had a, a very abrupt awakening when I took the dog out and it was pissing it down with rain. That wakes oh, so anyone that's up. That's how you wake up. That's how you get woken <laughs> yeah. up. Got it. Uh, do you drink coffee? Yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah. I normally wait for like uh, seven, eight before I start drinking. Okay. Again. Okay. Do you want to, like any jitters before pre pre seven a.m.? Got it, got it, boys. Um, it was a. Uh, I know we were chatting a little bit before. It was a little light, right? In terms of in terms of news flow. So uh, Carlos had thought maybe we could do a little bit of evergreen content, which I'm excited about. Something that I believe is up uh, up both of your alleys, which is OTC market making. Um, oh, yeah, making me yeah, think back there. Good. Yeah, this is a good one. I'm looking forward to this one. I, you know, you boys both were working at Deutsche Bank. Um, I started off at, at doing OTC marketing in, in different desks. Like Carlos, I know you were on the FX desk and Matt, you are on the, the rates desk. So I know those market dynamics are a little different. And um, both of those markets have probably some similarities and some differences to the DeFi and crypto market. And obviously the DeFi and crypto market is ever, ever evolving. But uh, super curious also to get your take on, you know, the evolution of OTC market making uh, within the DeFi space as well. Before uh, before we get into that, though, maybe for the listeners that are less familiar with OTC market making, we could talk a little bit more about what OTC market making is and why it exists. Yeah, so I think the OTC, whenever you hear the term, it stands for over the counter, right? Um, and what that effectively means is that unlike an exchange traded <clears throat> product where you, you call up an exchange, so in equities, think of like, you know, NASDAQ or New York stock exchange, the way that it works is that your counterparty is the exchange. Meaning if I buy a share of Apple from, you know, the NASDAQ exchange, uh, it is going to, <clears throat> my, my trading counterparty will be NASDAQ. And then they will take the other end of that trade momentarily, and then they will match me with another person that wants to buy or sell on the exchange. So um, it is anonymous in the sense that I don't know who my end counterparty is. I only face the exchange. Um, but it is also what we call lit, meaning um, there is a, a, a light shined on all of the processes of the exchange in the sense that the, the matching engine or the software that does all of the, you know, matching of buyers and sellers has this feature where it publishes the, um, current state of the order book, as well as all of the, um, all of the trades done instantaneously to all participants in the market, right? So if I buy, then, you know, within milliseconds, 
or or shorter of me of me you know making a purchase on the exchange the price will reflect the fact that you know i've just bought and other market participants will know not necessarily that you know carlos bought but that somebody on the exchange bought in this amount and at this price mm -hmm. um and so that has features and benefits the, the yeah. benefits of of working uh, of trading on the exchange is that you are counterparty safe right and in TradFi markets, this is something that's codified into law. You know, exchanges are you know required you know to operate with a certain set of like principles under which they um, have the assets to back. You know, the uh, the asset of their their client funds on the exchange. Uh, they do a good job to effectively make sure that you know when they're matching people that those funds are safe and secure, and that the people who are doing what they are doing are actually who they say and have the funds to back the transaction. Wait, right? that You're doesn't sound anything like uh, FTX, does it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or or maybe, maybe maybe even Binance, who knows, right? Um, <laughs> they should be listening that, to this podcast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, also an, an, another another key distinguishing feature is that um, the New York Stock Exchange does not have a market making team that works for them that specifically goes through trying to trade against their clients, um, which is a whole different story. Uh, point is, sounds, sounds like a business practice. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we talked about this before, but that's not how you do pants. <laughs> so, um, either way. Uh, that's that's the benefit of the exchange. So the 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 upside is that you kind of get to deal anonymously. It doesn't matter who you are, as long as you have the funds, you get to trade. Um, you are counterparty safe, right? Meaning, you know, you're not going to trade with some rogue counterparty who's you know going to buy your Bitcoin from you, but not have the cash to send back to you when the trade settles, right? Like um, these are all very good things in normal markets that are regulated. It's a well known construct. Um, over the counter is what I would call more of a trust based business. It's more of a relationship style business, but there are some benefits to it. So over the counter dealing would effectively be, I now have a direct relationship with the counterparty. So unlike the exchange where the exchange itself sits in between you, in this case, I'm going to call up. So in TradFi markets, it would be like, I'm going to call up JP Morgan and I'm going to call up Deutsche Bank and I want to call up Citi and I'm going to establish a line of credit with them and I'm going to, I'm going to trade with them throughout the course of the day. Um, and when I trade with them, uh, I trade explicitly with them, meaning they know exactly who's on the other side of the trade. And I know who exactly who's on the other side of the trade. Um, I get to choose who I want to deal with and they will stream to me a, a price right? Which is effectively the price that they're willing to buy and sell. It's not a publicly available price. The only person that gets to see that price is me. And I get to choose to deal on it. Um, the, the benefit to doing it this way is sort of like, no one really knows what that trade is, except for me and my counterparty. So if I want to, if I want to trade very large sizes, very small sizes, you know, whatever I want to do, so long as, so long as, um, you know, I'm dealing OTC or over the counter, it's a disclosed trading relationship with a known trusted counterparty and theoretically, but not always true. We'll get into this later. The details of that economic transaction are between me and my counterparty and nobody else. Can um, I, so can I, as a, uh, market participant that has a, like, let's say I call up JP Morgan. Can I shop my order around to multiple OTC participants to see if I can get a, the better price? And or so let, uh, maybe I'll just clarify a couple of things. And so Carl said that you get basically quoted a price if you go directly mm -hmm. to a, a customer. So there's two ways that will happen. One is an RFQ, which is a request for quote. This is you going to that counterparty and saying, hey, this is my, the economics of a trade I want to price. And then you, you give me a quote back. Mm -hmm. The other is a request for stream. So that is all called click and trade. So that is where you'll see prices on the screen and you basically hit the offer or the bid and you try and trade it now. 
and the subtle and that's almost kind of what it would be like in on an exchange you basically want to match off with that offer if you want to buy so you hit the hit that offer price to buy so that's how it would look if you were doing requests for stream you'd get something from the counterpart it could be two way usually is uh, and then you'll hit that offer uh, price so that uh, the difference is though the counterparty will have a last look so they can decide whether to accept it or not. So that's one thing that's like important to realize the difference. Uh, and then with the request for quote side of it, you can include many dealers on the ticket. So uh, as with the request for stream, you can ask for streams from multiple different vendors. Um, but the request for quote is interesting because you specifically ask for you know, X number of dealers up front and then you'll get quotes back from them. Okay. And then I think what's really interesting about the market, and I think this is actually one of the things that makes it really exciting from a research and from a technical perspective, is that you have these information asymmetries that abound uh, in the ecosystem. So in an exchange, um, I can at any point in time, if I'm a market maker on an exchange, I know exactly what the price is because I can just observe the price, mm -hmm. right? And the only... The only information asymmetry is basically the speed in which I can observe that price. And so, you know, you'll have market makers that fight and claw to basically have, you know, a microsecond faster connection to the exchange so that they can see the price and they can react to it faster. Mm -hmm. That is sort of irrelevant in OTC market making because, um, because the price that I'm quoting to any one client is completely independent. Right. The only thing that really matters is like understanding that I'm going to quote a price. Let's say, for example, um, you know, Robert Ridzak Capital is going to Matt and Carlos and we're both market makers. You ask us for a price. I don't know what Matt's going to quote. Um, I, I know roughly what the price in the market is because I can observe like the, mm -hmm. the, the lit venue and use that as a baseline for my price. But there's so many different factors that might go into my willingness to quote you versus Matt's willingness to quote you. And so there's this there's this sort of game theoretical um, problem that you need to solve to manage this information asymmetries. Like, I don't know, uh, I don't know what Matt's incentives are. I don't know what mine is. I can guess, and mm -hmm. you can kind of build some models around this, but the game of OTC market making is less around being the fastest to market, but more about being the best to deal with those information asymmetries and being the best to deal with sort of like the, the risk management perspective. Um, because quite frankly, like you're, you, Robert, as a customer aren't in microseconds flashing back to me, the price that Matt quoted you in order right. to get a better price. You're, you're just yeah. comparing it. And then I get, I get to make a choice. So it's like the difference then between that, like we're using the, the, the stock market. So, if I was thinking about, maybe, maybe we're jumping ahead because I know we're going to talk about risks. Um, the risk for OTC market and a lip in you is less about market pricing risk, right? Because there's a lot more, like you mentioned, it's a lot about like technology and connectivity and being able to process information more quickly than others. That to me sounds like what the a, a predominant risk is in that versus OTC market making. There's a little bit more qualitative. I don't know that's not the right word, but just the, the risk like information asymmetry and trying to understand incentives. That's a lot less technical in my, in my view, but uh, maybe you guys have thoughts on it. Yeah. I think that there's the, the way, the way that I think about it, at least from a technical per perspective is sort of yeah. like in any market making operation, there's what I'd like to call the, um, deterministic technology portion. Mm -hmm. And then there's the probabilistic technology okay, portion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if you read, if you read like the S1 filing for like Virtu Financial when they went public, right? Um, they say, we are a technology company. We do not take market risk. Like our job is completely to match buyers and sellers and to do so in a very efficient and speedy way. <clears throat> um, so. When you're dealing on lit venues on like, for example, the American stock exchange or American stock exchange is not the American stock exchange. Um, <laughs> then like, like you said, it's, it's almost a deterministic policy that you're following at all times. You just want to be the fastest to follow that policy, right? Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of probabilistic thing because that would involve taking some risk 
anytime you have to build a statistical model about something, you're basically admitting to the universe that you don't know the information. So you ha you kind of have to guess using historical data. I like instead of Versus... guessing, I like to use probabilities. <laughs> you know, we don't guess. Yeah, we use probabilities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and, smart these guys. Yeah. So so the. The, 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 on, the, on the other end of it is like when you're dealing OTC, you you simply don't have all the information in the market. And so you are forced to, um, you know, be fast enough, right? Because you're still using lit venues as a benchmark. There's no market that's purely OTC that has like zero public information available um, outside of maybe some like esoteric bond markets or something like mm. that. But, you know, generally speaking, there's still at least some portion of the market that is public and lit, right? And uh, that exists for price discovery. But OTC benchmarks will benchmark their price off of those publicly available prices. And then they will also sort of like factor in their own view of the world in terms of the information asymmetries that they have. And, um, you know, make some probabilistic like decision when they're pricing a client. And so therefore, the skill set to be an OTC market maker is more about sort of being comfortable with uncertainty and developing some informed view as to handle that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the no, like I saw one of the comments you were talking about, like why people use it was that um, the pricing can be significantly better. And I, I is that just because um, you're like, you're just paying for certainty of like, so if you go to exchange and you want to do like a block trade on an exchange, it's going to be expensive, but at least you'll know like what it is versus I, I mean, mm. walking through and it's not well, like quite clear to me. I think there's a couple of reasons. So <clears throat> one, an OTC provider would usually aggregate a lot of order book information. So they'll already be mm -hmm. connected to a ton of exchanges kind of on your behalf. So you could go to them and hopefully get the tightest pricing across Coinbase, Kraken, Derivative, Ibit, whoever it is, mm -hmm. um, rather than you having to build out connectivity to each of them. So that's one thing. I see. So you kind of get it by de facto of just there being tighter spreads in general um, because they've aggregated more liquidity sources. Um, and then on top of, kind of what Carlos was saying about, depends on what their risk profile looks like. So in general, uh, if that counterparty has been trading and getting longer and longer, so people have been selling to that counterparty, they're going to be more axed to buy, to, to sell, right? They've been getting long. So clients have been selling. That means the OTC guy's been getting long as a desk. So they then have to hedge to sell. So if you come in and you want to offset that flow, they're more likely to give you a tighter price because they'll have mm -hmm. to go hedge it in the market anyway. So they might as well just go inside of the, the uh, uh, what do you call them? Lit venues. Central limit order books. It's a bit yeah. cheaper to just go a bit or two inside, or depending on what it is, right? A couple of cent or something, and then everyone's happy. You get out of risk. The client gets a good, better price. It kind of works yeah. for everyone. And I think that what you'll what you'll see is that when you take multiple OTC providers together, right? So this and this is what a lot of the large hedge funds will do in the world. So they can go on to you know Nasdaq or whatever, and they'll see a price at like you know, 99,101, mid price is 100, right? They can, uh, they can sell at 99, they can buy at 101. So what will end up happening is that market maker, you know, B, for their own risk management purposes, will say, oh, well, you know, <clears throat> um, I'd rather be a buyer than a seller because of my own risk position. So I'm going to kind of shade my price up a little bit. So my, my price is 100, 101. And then market maker uh, A will actually say, you know what, like I've got different clients uh, and, you know, randomly I'd rather be a seller than a buyer. And so that the published price is, you know, 99, 101, but I, I think I'd probably rather be 99, 100. Mm -hmm. And so what you can see as, you know, Robert Capital now getting, you know, market maker A and market maker B's price, which they've independently skewed for their own risk management purposes. When you add those two together, you actually now see a price of 100, 100. Yeah, so you're trying to in at mid, which is perfect. If assuming that's like where the, the mid of the central limit market is. 
the observable market. Robert uh, Capital is so very just... pleased. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> the, 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 trader, the trader at Robert Capital is very pleased. Now, there's actually another reason why OTC market making can be cheaper, and it this now this now extends to the market maker. So, um, if I'm a market maker and I um, make a price to NASDAQ, right? Um, I'm going to get any number of clients because the only thing that you need to deal on the market on the exchange is some capital and pass whatever KYC checks they have, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I can get um, some scumbag toxic flow uh, and I could also get like really good benign flow, right? Um, and if I'm a market maker, I have to price to the average. So you kind of get this tragedy of the commons game theoretic where like there are going to be some scumbags in the pool that are going to make the pricing worse for everybody because a market maker can't, you know, price to the best clients. It has to kind of price to the worst clients in the pool. Mm -hmm. Um, and in an OTC relationship, it's completely and totally, um, custom. And it's, it's, uh, rather than being anonymous, it is bilateral, meaning, you know, uh, as a market maker, now I get the choice to price or not price scumbag toxic capital and good guys capital <laughs> way different than if I were to go to the exchange, I just need to make a blanket price for everybody and yeah. scumbag toxic capital ruins the price that everyone else gets. So. If you, and we'll talk about what is exactly good flow and what's not good flow. Um, but generally speaking, if a OTC market maker views your flow as being good, then they will give you much better pricing and much tighter pricing than you would ever get at a lit venue because like they don't have to price to toxic scumbag capital, which ruins the average for everybody. And then generally speaking, a market maker kind of has two choices when they uh, deal with toxic scumbag capital. One would be get out of here. We don't want your flow. Mm -hmm. And the second would be, yeah, I'll price you. There's a price for everybody, but the price is garbage because I don't want your flow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and how do, can you, how can you tell when someone is garbage? Like what, like what do people, what people do that would make you think that what they're, I mean, it's typically price impact. So okay. someone will okay. trade, it will just go against you immediately okay. or within some <laughs> time frame that, that you manage to do. And that is... Uh, I see. So it's more so it's like repeated, repeated patterns where you see like you'll deal with uh, one of these other participants and something will go, the market will go against you a couple like repeat where it's more than just a fluke necessarily. You see there's exactly some... so it's not not a one-off and, and I've, you know, yeah I've, I've i've seen traders get very upset with like oh this guy came in and ripped me off he does it all the time and you're like does he really like it happened once this year you just it, you may have got ripped off once badly but that could have been you priced them around an event and there was a big market move and you just didn't wipe yeah. out which you should have uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. You, you need to mitigate for one-off effects because you know, it's not fair. You know, someone, you know, Apple could just do their pay, pay their uh, you know, clients at one time, do an FX transaction to Europe, and that just happened to be around the time when there was some big market news for a DPEG mm -hmm. or something. So it's not fair to like ding people for like one offs. Um, but if they're consistently doing it, uh, it would show that they have an edge. And that's one thing in OTC pricing that is interesting is you can look back at the flow that you got and kind of work out who's who's the good guys, who's doing stuff that's yeah. uh, okay. more new. So I would, I would call that a first order effect, right? So the, the, the first order effect of OTC pricing in terms of like figuring out if someone's a good guy or a bad guy is, is to say, um, when they deal with me, does the price move against me immediately? And the time horizon is really going to depend. In fact, I would say if anyone is ever dealing with an OTC provider, the number one thing that you should really ask them before you get set up with them is what is your risk holding horizon, right? How long do you expect to hold risk? Mm -hmm. And some, some OTC providers would be like, you know, days or hours or minutes or seconds. Uh, it really depends. But the, 
there's a lot of information that you can get from understanding what the risk holding horizon is. Um, and the most important thing that you should learn from that really is how do they evaluate their flow? So if I'm dealing in such a way that I know that the price is going to go against my market maker mm -hmm. uh, in that time horizon. So let's say they come back to you and say 30 seconds. <clears throat> um, and my strategy, like my alpha is, you know, a one second time horizon. So anytime I deal with them, that means that in their stated risk holding horizon, they're going to lose money if I make money. And now you're entering with a zero sum game, mm. right? Now, if my alpha horizon is like an hour and their risk holding horizon is 30 seconds, <clears throat> then if I'm right, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've made or lost money because, you know, I'm not trying to make money in the next 30 seconds. I'm trying to make money in the next hour. Mm -hmm. So like the, the biggest thing that really sort of matches off, like what kind of liquidity you should be using is really, um, does your alpha horizon match up with the alpha horizon of the market maker? If yeah. That's, different... that's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah. As a client, that's that. As Carl said, that's the first thing you should ask. Is yeah, because if they don't, if you're acting on, like if your counterpart is managing risk to a shorter time frame than say the alpha view that you have, then they potentially will just hedge against that position immediately, like immediately, and then you'll lose whatever edge you were hoping to to exert in the market. I see. So you almost you want the OTC market maker that you're dealing with then to have a longer time horizon than than you. Is that but the not, not necessarily. I really? think you okay. you just want them to have a different time horizon than you. Mm. Um, and ideally, uh, and this is this is another important thing. When you are dealing OTC, when you when you're let's say like you're you're a reasonable like sized person, and otherwise you probably wouldn't have OTC relationships. Um, you are making the assumption that they are going to deal discreetly in the market, right? And, and, and what, what does that mean? Um, because this is an important thing. What you pay for when you do OTC is discretion, right? Because otherwise you deal on a lit venue. Like if you wanted, if you wanted the world to know what you were dealing, um, then you'd want to deal on an exchange. Um, and if your alpha horizon is really short, you'd actually prefer to deal on an exchange anyway. Um, because like all that you care about is the maximum amount of liquidity you can get at this moment at that price, and then you deal on it. Um, mm -hmm. The game theoretics of it kind of work out that if you, um, if you deal with an OTC person, what you're really hoping is that your alpha horizon is longer than their risk holding horizon, but that their risk holding horizon is um, long enough for them to organically work out of risk, right? Meaning what you're hoping is that when you go to them and you buy, that they're going to match you eventually. They're going to have to hold on to that risk for some period of time, and that's what they get paid for. Mm -hmm. You're hoping that instead of instead of going directly to a lit venue to hedge, you're hoping that they wait until they find an offsetting trade to manage their books, right? Because otherwise, if I deal with you directly as an OTC market maker, and the first thing that you do within milliseconds is go out to a lit venue, then you may as well have fucking traded on a lit venue, mm -hmm. right? Now yeah. you just have like a you you now just have a middleman who did something that you could have done yourself. Yeah, right. just so taking the cut, um, cut a spread or whatever. The, the person. Yeah, because they're they're gonna they're gonna price you basically. Like if if a market maker decides that they cannot handle your flow because your alpha horizon is too short for them, right? What they're gonna do is they're gonna say, "Fine, I'll quote you. I don't give a fuck. I'll quote anybody, but I'm gonna quote you at the rate that I can, I know I can cover it in an a lit venue, plus some spread." So if that's the pricing you're getting from an OTC market maker, you may as well just go to the venue anyway. And you know for a fact that's what they're going to do. And hope your fees are, are less. Yeah. Well, I think it comes back yeah. to um, like the first order impact you asked, Rob. How do you know if, if they're a bad 
client, what we talked about, mm-hmm. toxicity, market impact, those are kind of the, the key things, the price mm-hmm. impact after trade. So this is known as a transaction cost analysis, but it goes both ways. So you, and that's what Carlos is alluding to, like really is that you can analyze the transactions that you send to a, a dealer as well as they can analyze yours. It's bilateral and you both have the information. So you can both actually see who's managing flow in the right way or sending yeah. good flow versus <clears throat> who's executing poorly. It goes both ways depending if you're the client board, but yeah. you have to kind of be set up to do that. That's the, that's the catch. Yeah. And, okay. and the big thing too, is that you can, you can analyze each other's cotton flow until you're blue in the face, but eventually you just get on a phone with each other and you're like, guys, your flow looks kind of shit. Yeah. And that's Tell actually, me why I should keep pricing you. <laughs> that's actually the easiest way to resolve it as well. Like really, just get what on the phone and speak. Did you, you just, is, I mean, this is like, I, I know we were going to try to save this for them, but like, is this just like relationship? It'd be, you're, I obviously with an OTC marketing and trading, it's all very technical and quantitative, but you're still at the end of the day, you're dealing with human beings. So being able to, like you said, like understanding incentives and what's going on, this kind of like seems like a, a unique quality, right? That's a little outside of the other ones that we just your it's, ability to interact yeah. with clients. I think the number the number one reason or the number one skill set that you should have if you're dealing in an OTC market is to be technical, but to be able to use those technical terms and those technical techniques as a way to communicate. So for example, like it's one thing just to have a formula that tells you what the you know average price movement was across n number of seconds after you trade, right? And so like I can go to a client and say, oh well, your your price impact is you know a basis point after thirty seconds, and that's just a matter of fact statement. Mm-hmm. But it's another thing to say, okay, <clears throat> um, get on the phone with a client and say your price impact moves against me by a basis point after thirty seconds. Um, I price you at a half a basis point. Uh, this does not make sense. So what are you doing that's causing this? Can we work with you a little bit in terms of like, you know, managing that circumstance? Um, mm-hmm. I tend to see a relationship of when X happens in the market, you guys deal. Can you alter that in some way? Or is that core to your strategy? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is there, uh, is there, is, is it, would it be okay if I, you know, priced you wider over that event, you know, mm-hmm. but then gave you solid, consistent pricing otherwise, because the, that's, you know, sort of, you know, and so th- there, there's this element of like negotiation and working with each other and, and communicating mm-hmm. with each other in a way that sort of like says, let's use this, let's use this hard mathematical truth as um, a common ground that we can establish in our dialogue. But then let's kind of like find, you know, subjective things that we can do and experiment with to make the flow win-win for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the that's the big thing in terms of like dealing with large OTC uh, relationships. Does that does that tie into things like information leakage? Um, just to like, it, if, it does. It does. It does. Yeah. So if you think about it, um, like, what what's the probably the worst thing you could do it would be you've got 100 potential lps so liquidity providers and you go okay everyone quote me now uh you're going to then get a really great price from what you know you start to get large numbers of people there's bound to be some skew or asymmetry in one of those people you're mm-hmm. going to take that price and likely that's going to go against that person could be random too like you may not be doing this intentionally you may not have an alpha view that someone skewed and it just happens that you you'll basically be picking people off by accident just because if there's different skews in the market so your flow mm-hmm. may look very toxic and you're also basically depending on what the type of trade is like if it's an RQ for instance you you're broadcasting a lot of uh, market intention of what you're trying to transact. Yeah, so then all those other OTC market makers know that this guy, this like exactly. whale is shopping his order yeah. around, which would make that exactly. person who actually takes the flow to be even, even more toxic, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so okay. in, an RFQ, in an RFQ relationship where people are spamming the market and asking everyone and their mom, in fact, the most valuable place to be in the market is the cover or the second best price, right? Because you get the information, 
you know you look good yeah you look good to your client it, right because you're there you right? look yeah, you, yeah. you look at you can look good to your client because you're there and you also know that some other asshole won that flow <laughs> and it's like okay someone priced that better than me and so now i know two things i know that there's a client who's dealing a very large trade and i also know that there's another market maker who is asked to take on that other very large, large trade and i can use that information to push the market against both of them and make money, but I also still look good to the client. It's a yeah. very skeptical or yeah. cynical way yeah. of viewing it, but like, yeah. I know a lot. I know a lot of bank market makers that look at it that exact way. Well, right? it's kind of so like buyer's remorse. That's how you make money, you know? Yeah, like there's this whole like concept of yeah. buyer's remorse, right? It's like you like you you, you <laughs> won, but like okay, well, what did I? You know, you you yeah. price it. So too. there's actually <laughs> a, a great paper. I would I would recommend uh, I would recommend that. Anybody that ever wants to deal in an OTC market, read papers by a guy named Rule Uman um, at at, uh, at Deutsche Bank. Um, he was both Matt and I's boss for a number of years, but he's also just very much like an OG when it comes to mm. um, quant trading, especially in the OTC space. And he talks about the game theoretics of of, um, of dealing. And there's a very real phenomenon called the winner's curse, where if you win an OTC trade, it is because you had the most off-market price to your clients. Um, mm. And as Matt was saying, if if clients deal in such a way where they ask too many people, right? And so they aggregate all these prices and then anytime they win, they're increasing the amount of the winner's curse on their counterparties. It won't take long before all of their counterparties are like, oh, this guy's actually kind of shit, mm -hmm. right? I don't, and it, and it may not be because the client is explicitly shit. They might not do, be doing anything bad, but just because of the ripples they're making in the market, right? By asking too many people yeah. and, and basically like, they could be the most benign flow in the world, but because of the information they're throwing out to the market by asking a hundred market makers, yeah. Um, they're screwing whoever wins the trade. And then shortly they will only be left with the worst market makers quoting them very wide prices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think about it, what, what will happen is you'll mm -hmm. say you have a hundred, everyone's quoting and all of a sudden like you know, DB or someone is going, <laughs> hang on, I'm not really winning many of these trades. This is like Apple. What's going on here. Okay. Let's try Titan. So everyone's going to then slowly tighten. So the clients are oh, great. We're getting tight prices. But then as you tighten, you, the winner's curse gets worse, right? So your impact against the spread you've charged magnifies because you're charging less spread, so you're going to earn less money. You'll get picked off randomly again, and mm. it kind of compounds. So then you widen out, and then all of a sudden that client gets shit liquidity. So it actually makes a lot more sense to have a much tighter pool of liquidity providers just in general, people that you trust that manage to the kind of things we were talking about. Like what's the horizon? How do they actually manage, uh, hedge? What's their internalization rates? That's really important as well. Like, d is most of the flow recycled within that OTC desk, or is it? Are they actually hedging on the street because yeah. they don't have enough flow to offset it? So there's a and lot of these the, other things that come into play. And then the other the other thing that happens too is so there's the the winner's curse, and then there's also the prisoner's dilemma. Right? <laughs> so think of it. Think of it from the perspective of the market makers. You're at a stage of the market where the people in the market decided it for themselves, okay, I'm just going to ask everyone because now, now I get the best price. This is awesome. Okay. So easy. And you, yeah, so it's so easy. I just ask everyone what their price is and then I get the tightest price in the world. And by the way, this is exactly where the crypto market is right now. So this is actually super relevant. Yeah, that was um, and I'll tell you. That. Cool. And I'll, I'll tell you where I'll tell you when I'm done how this has evolved to the um, FX market. Um, me on a cliffhanger because because that's that's where crypto was going fyi yeah. um so uh in the crypto market it's basically what we saw in like fx you know years ago which you know caused rule to write all these papers it's like people was like oh it's so easy i just get so much better pricing if i ask everybody and then now what ends up happening is that if you're a market maker you know that the flow that you get over OTC is actually kind of hot garbage, right? Because you have to quote tighter prices to win, um, but effectively you're getting exchange style information leakage because every market maker on the street knows that there's some big flow going through the market. So it doesn't take long for the, the information to get out. It's like, oh, there's a big buyer out there. Mm -hmm. Let's drive the price up. So you've had to quote, you've had to quote 
a tighter price to win flow that everyone else knows about and is going to go against you. So as a market maker, you now, uh, theoretically, OTC market makers get paid to warehouse risk, meaning when I, I, I win an OTC deal, the thing that I should be doing right, is quoting a price and then waiting until <clears throat> I get someone to offset that price. But if I know that everyone else knows about that deal, because they've asked 100 people and the 99 other market makers that didn't win the flow now know what's, what's happening and they're aggressively moving the price against, against me, um, then my incentive is actually to hedge as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. right? The minute I get flow, it's out the door because I can't afford to hold on to it because I've got, I'm, I'm dealing in this toxic cesspool where everyone else is using that information against me as soon as it comes out the door. Um, and that's pretty, that's pretty not good for everybody involved. So how do people make, how do you as an OTC market maker make money? Now in, <laughs> in, in crypto, I'll tell you right now, I think the stage of the market that we're at is basically, um, fee arbitrage, hmm. meaning an OTC market maker just kind of knows that, um, there's lots of information leakage in the market. And they don't get paid to really warehouse risk. Um, so all that they really do is they aggregate all of the public venues and they deal in enough volume that their fees are lower than everyone else's fees. <clears throat> so the benefit to dealing with a crypto OTC market maker is often just that, you know, instead of paying a percent and a half on Coinbase, they, they pay like zero to deal on Coinbase. Or get a rebate someplace. Or, or, yeah, or get a rebate. So now that they, now they can effectively give you, you know, they'll, they'll charge you like a half a basis point and they'll hedge it immediately on a lit venue. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll basically make the differential of the spread they charge you, which is halfway in between what they pay and what you would pay on the exchange. And then they just deal directly on the exchange anyway. <clears throat> um, so that's, that, that is a state of the world where basically like you've got a bunch of information that's leaking out all the time. There's not the infrastructure to sort of like make sure that people are doing the right yeah. things. So you just assume that everyone's doing the wrong things and you just take the flow and you hedge it immediately. <clears throat> um, and you just basically earn the differential between like where the market, uh, prices you as a market maker in terms of fees and where they would price a normal you know, average Joe on the street. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. I like, obviously we, we've talked about this before, just the, the fees that are charged on centralized exchanges are just like, egregious, at least for the, the novice investor, the a retail person that's paying yeah. the full spread. Um, but market may, but that's also kind of done in a way that allows the market makers to make money because they can avoid those fees yeah. and still be able to quote in markets. And so still be able to make money. But it's all it's just it's also to your point, like a lot of signals that this is just still such a nascent market. It's not very yeah. it's not sophisticated. And now let me now let me tell you where this is gonna go, because th this is this is exactly what happened in the FX market. Um so now what ends up happening is let's say BlackRock creates an ETF, right? And they need to go out and they need to buy lots of um lots of Bitcoin in size. And so does Fidelity and Invesco and all these other guys. Um, and then you also get large institutions like, you know, PIMCO and, you know, CalPERS and Texas Teachers and all these sort of like large players in the market that deal in size. And, you know, they, they need to go out and buy several hundred million of Bitcoin at a time because they have, you know, 10 trillion in assets under management. And they decided to allocate 0.1% of their, you know, capital to it. <clears throat> um, they're going to go to a market maker. And that market maker is going to quote them a price. And then immediately thereafter, that market maker is going to go hedge in, you know, Coinbase and Binance or whatever and drive the price up against them. And they are going to get the most angry vitriolic phone call on the fucking planet from the execution manager over at BlackRock or PIMCO or wherever else. And be like, what the actual fuck are you doing? <laughs> and that is not a joke. I've been mm -hmm. on the other end of that call. Right. Because you think about it, like if you move the price against them by even a basis point, like, and you, you know, this Rob, like how much does a basis point matter in terms of like, you know, overall portfolio, um, carry um, on like a institutional, uh, institutional, uh, platform. 
Is it, you're, you're, you're trying to like pick up pennies in front of the steamroller, right? Like you look at like ETF charges and stuff at lot broader market. I mean, it's just like, and you're also dealing with, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. So one basis point can add up, uh, add up quite, quite a bit to your total P and L. Yeah. And so they say, get your shit together. or We're going to find someone else who can. Yeah. Right. Um, and then now you get this thing in the market where the large guys are demanding you to actually be an OTC market maker. And so then you say to yourself, well, how do I actually make this work? How do I, how do I warehouse risk for a very large guy who's expecting tight prices and, and doing that? Well, the answer becomes that you start policing the shit out of each other's flow, right? And you start doing, you model it out explicitly. You keep track of everything, right? In, in an OTC world, you're, you're effectively, um, your job is to be a bit of like a penny pincher. You're a bean counter. You're making sure that statistically, you know exactly where all the flow is going. And I guarantee you that the guys over at, you know, Fidelity and BlackRock and PIMCO and CalPERS and whomever else have literally invested millions of dollars in what's called post-trade analytics or TCA, total cost analysis. Mm -hmm. And they will be able to pinpoint the exact second, the exact millisecond that you went out into the market to hedge their flow. And they'll be like, yeah, we saw that. Why are you doing that? That's pretty stupid. And mm. that level of accountability forces people to um, to manage the way that they deal in the market. We've not seen that in crypto yet, right? That's something that we've seen in traditional markets for ages. Um, you know, I think Matt and I both maybe have like a little PTSD in terms of like dealing with you know execution managers on the other end of it, where you're you're basically sort of like having to be. Uh, be held into account for all the things that you do. And so that's like, that's first order of business number one is that they wanna make sure when they're dealing with you that you're not going out directly and dealing into a lit venue. Mm. Now, there's a very, very, very important thing also that happens. Um, as an OTC market maker, I have the choice when I'm hedging to do one of two things, right? The first is that I can just explicitly hedge in a lit venue, and that's bad, and people will find that because you know that market data is available to all sophisticated market participants, and they will track that. The second thing about information leakage is that an OTC market maker has the ability to what's called skew their price, right? Which means, let's say I am now, you know, I'm now short um, because a, a client's buying, so Pimco is buying a lot. I'm on the other end of it. I'm now short. So I'm going to skew my pricing a little bit such that the price I'm willing to buy is slightly better than the average Joe, right? Um, and when I do that, I'm now going to show that price to all of my OTC clients. So I'm going to have these little API shops that you know connect to my stream and they'll say, oh, well, Carlos is actually, um, it looks like he's short Bitcoin right now, because he's showing, you know, pricing that indicates that he'd rather, you know, be a buyer than a seller. Mm -hmm. And when I compare Carlos's price to Matt price, you know, his, uh, his buy price is, is probably a little bit better. So I'm gonna, I'm going to assume that, um, that Carlos is, is currently short Bitcoin. And, and this is, and you're, you're talking about Carlos as the market maker. Got, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Carlos is the market maker. Uh, I'm dealing with Pimco. They've come in and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'd, I, I'd like to buy. Now I'm going to be a good market maker. I'm not going to go out and just buy on the exchange because that would be bad. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my price, you know, uh, a little bit in such that I'm a, I'm a better buyer than the exchange. Okay. Now let's say I am a, uh, I'm an enterprising API client of Carlos, uh, the market maker. This now gives me an arbitrage opportunity, right? Because I can um, I can place limit orders on the exchange, and I can get hit at a worse price than I can currently cover. So now all I need to do as a as a client of Carlos mm -hmm. is just I can make money by knowing that Carlos is a buyer and that I can get a better price um, at Carlos's OTC market making shop than I can on the exchange. And so 
now because I've done that, um, if I don't, if I, if, if Carlos doesn't know what his clients are doing, it's actually really easy for clients to proxy deal on a lit venue for you. Hmm. Right. Cause they're, they're just, they're seeing an arbitrage opportunity. They're seeing that Carlos price is here. The exchange is here. Right. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm just going to bite on the exchange and then sell it yeah. back to Carlos at a slightly better price. Hmm. And so why would I not do that? Yeah. And, and, uh, this, this now creates a whole different game for OTC market makers, which is, um, now, not only do I need to have my own risk management in check because BlackRock and PIMCO are beating me to shit in terms of like how I'm dealing in the market, but I also need to police all of my small API clients to make sure that they're not taking my price and they're not dealing on the market for me. I explicitly am not dealing on the market, but I need yeah. to make sure that I'm not providing the incentive structure for my clients to go out and deal on the market on my behalf. Because that also causes, you know, information leakage and that causes price impact. And, you know, PIMCO doesn't care if I'm not dealing in the market, but my clients are. They just care that someone's dealing in the market because they are, and that fucks up their pricing. Yeah. So then Does do that make to, sense? Yeah. So then do you have, like, that's a lot of, that's a lot of conflicting. It sounds like there's a lot of conflicting incentives. Like, and I, so do you have to, do, in those situations, do you just have to limit API a API flow or how, how do you, how do you manage there's, that? There's, there's two things that you do. The first is if you have an untrustworthy client, meaning like, uh, ideally you'd show a, a better price to an API client and they would say, oh, I'm a natural offsetting flow and that is a better price for me. So therefore I will just deal on that. Right. right. That's the intended use case. Um, on the other hand, if I, um, if I have a, a bad client, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just giving them incentives to be bad, right? mm -hmm. to do things that are against my, my outcome that I'd like, um, then if I know that they're bad, then I'm just not going to show them a skewed price, right? Mm -hmm. They're just going to get a normal, they're going to get a normal wide price. But the question is, is that there's always some uncertainty in terms of like who's a good client and a good and a bad client because i can't prove necessarily that they're what their intent is when they're dealing with me i don't make them like a sign a form that says oh i'm just using this price because it, it it's good for me versus i'm dealing on this and i'm also dealing on another platform right now so yeah. it, it becomes very difficult to prove so then there's a whole series of tests that people can create as an otc market maker to basically statistically and probabilistically say um you know what? I'm not certain, but I'm reasonably confident that you guys are taking my skewed pricing that I'm showing you as a benefit to you mm -hmm. and you're screwing me. And most importantly, you're screwing my largest clients that quite frankly pay the bills. Yeah. So, um, that, that is, that is, that is a, a rabbit hole that the crypto market has not gone down at all. Mm. Um, that OTC market makers in FX anyway, have been doing for years. Like I'll give you a case in point in OTC market making for banks. When you sign up as a new client, we routinely what's called watermark our SKUs, which means that you will get a random unique SKU. Um, and what we'll do is we'll show you a random unique SKU that no one else gets to see, but you, right. And then we will monitor order placement on lit venues. So that we can basically say, all right, I showed you a random unique SKU. It's a signature, that, basically. Just, yeah, just a signature, right? That mm -hmm. says, I'm showing Robert a unique signature. And then you went out to venue A, B, and C, and you mimicked my pricing. Mm -hmm. Right? And it, cause it's an algorithm doing it. It's not like yeah. there's a guy doing yeah. it. It's like, it's an yeah. algorithm that's going to see it. And it's, and it's just going to see it and do some movement in the market. And you're like, all right. So the likelihood of this just being like a random coincidence is pretty low. So mm -hmm. I know that you're taking my price and you're recycling it on a venue and that's not what I want. So I'm not going to show you a skewed pricing ever again. Mm -hmm. Or you just right. say, or that like it literally happened where they've done it by accident and you're like, look, we, we give you two streams. One can be a <laughs> fixed price and one's the skewed price. So just don't quote the skewed price <laughs> through your system kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, um, 
there's a number of different ways to do it, but I, I guess the, the point is, is like, there's, there's a lot invested from a technological perspective yeah. to make sure that like people aren't taking your price and recycling it on a different venue mm -hmm. because that fucks your ability as a market maker to be able to handle these large OTC tickets. Yeah. So, so like, and just kind of like wrapping this all back up into the crypto markets, like where the state of it, cause like you were touching on this quite a bit, which is interesting about where the current state is in the crypto market. And it feels like where it's so, it's still so early in its development, largely because we haven't had a lot of institutional flow. A lot of it's been retail or early adopters of crypto yeah. that have made a lot of money. There's still large trades for an individual, but they are certainly not large trades for ins institutions or corporations. And so, especially yeah. with ETF flows, which can be hundreds of billions of dollars, right, in a single day that are traded, um, we haven't seen those type of flows really in, in the crypto space yet. So it's yeah. like, this is like a whole nother level of liquidity provisions and uh, and tech that has to be built out for the for the DeFi space. Yeah, I th and so I think there, there's, there's two things that I've noticed about the space, like you said, you're bang on. We've not really seen the institutional flow come in. So therefore, the infrastructure on the sell side for need, crypto just, yeah. just doesn't doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're dealing with with guys that are going to deal like 10 Bitcoin, you know, at a retail level or even like a small hedge fund, right? They're going to put the hedge fund has, you know, 10 million in capital in crypto land, which is not very much in TradFi, but it's fairly sizable crypto hedge fund. Mm -hmm. And they, de they deploy a million dollars. That's a big deal for them. But in terms of flow, it's really not that big of a fucking deal, right? Um, yeah. And so like you can just go in the market and you can deal and the, the post-trade price impacts not doesn't really hurt them that much versus mm -hmm. like when BlackRock and Invesco and you know Fidelity all come into the there. When they see you deal a million in the market, they're like, Yeah, but I've got ninety nine more behind it. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> right? That when when that type of flow is routine and regular and a and a everyday part of market makers' businesses, that's when you'll see the infrastructure Shift. by demand yeah. kind of like shift. Mm -hmm. And it's just not there yet. So Additionally, I think what ends up happening is people give OTC markets way, way, way more credibility than they deserve at this point. Mm. So you'll see stuff on Twitter is like, oh, you'll you'll never know when BlackRock is, is dealing in the market because, you know, it's all going OTC. And I'm like, ah, I, ch I challenge that because right now the OTC market makers aren't built up to warehouse hundreds of millions of dollars in risk, right? Mm. They're not built up to deal discreetly. So it's like, well, we, not, they, we already saw the... Uh... DOJ impact, right? Yeah. And that was a yeah. pretty big sell off. <laughs> so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So they're, yeah. they're just not equipped to handle it in a discreet way because they're not. They don't have the economic incentive to, mm -hmm. right? They're equipped to quote and cover, uh, which means that, like, when BlackRock comes to them or when the DOJ comes to them and says, hey, like, we want to do a very large market order, like, nine times out of 10, they're going to just hedge that as quickly as possible or their skew is going to be, you know, so large that people are going to catch on to it very quickly and their clients are going to be arbitraging them in the exchange. So mm -hmm. um, I, I'd say for now, like people concerned about OTC markets and like how it's this like kind of shadow market and there's no information. No, like I can assure you the information leakage right now in crypto is exceptionally high because the infrastructure to do it the right way just doesn't exist at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so like, but like, even the like information, like the information will get. I mean, I guess because your point's more about the time horizon, right? So like, as the as the DeFi space gets more built out, there's more uh, DeFi market makers that come in that are more equipped to handle those type of large institutional flows. It's is it just that? I mean, it, ultimately things will have to get traded. Things will ultimately go through a lit veneer at some at some point, right? That that's ultimately kind of like the the end goal. It's just like. How that's managed in theory, in theory, no, right? Because mm. you could have, you know, Rob and Carlos both want to trade a million. They're completely upsetting. One of you is buying, one of you is selling. You both come to me. I effectively mm -hmm. price you each however I choose. Could be at mid, could charge a bit of spread. You basically matched up. So that actually yeah. doesn't leave just us. It's all bilateral. You don't know that you two have faced each other, but yeah. technically you have. I've just matched you up separately. Yeah. So the the rate that we used to use at in OTC market making for exchange would be what was called internalization rate. Mm -hmm. Right. And internalization rate means what's the rate of total flow that I 
handle without touching an external venue. Yeah. Um, and in FX, the best market makers are like 97 to 99% internalized. Wow. That's right? much Which means that. that yeah. and, and the shit market makers are like 85% mm. internalized, right? So the majority of the flow in FX is all internal bank to bank, um, large counterparty to large counterparty. It's very, very, very infrequently. It's really only like the exhaust, right? Or the stuff that they just know they can't, you know, um, uh, internalize that they're going to go out to the market to hedge. Okay. So if you don't have access to the OTC market in FX, you don't have any information. You're only seeing the worst bits of flow that the internalized OTC guys choose not to, not to deal on. Right. So mm -hmm. publicly available information is very hard to come by in FX because of just this, this economic incentive to internalize as much as you possibly can. Um, other, other markets have like different things. I don't know what it was in, in, um, in treasuries, but treasuries is a different sort of like setup. Yeah. It, it depends on your flow rates specifically. So like, you know, everyone's got uh, paychecks to pay and books to balance. And so FX, this transactions hundreds a second, right? Treasuries is like, you know, you're talking minute scale. So you might see like a thousand trades a day or something. Um, and also the, the, the setups are somewhat different in, and we talked about this at the start, the RFQs and requests for streams. Like RFQs are weird. So the difference we hear is like treasuries would be 95% or over 90% RFQ uh, request for quote, where, and then the rest is the streaming. Uh, in FX, it's completely flipped. So it's like, I think it's more like 98% is uh, stream. And then mm -hmm. the remaining one or two percent is uh, request for quote. So they're, they're kind of flip the other way, but the size differentials are different. So you probably have people doing larger sizes on on the quotes. Um, but yeah, the it just the internalization rate was more like yeah, what Carlos would call the the shit end of the FX spectrum <laughs> in Treasury. But yeah. like I said, it, it all depends on flow rates. If you don't have any flow to offset, then you have to go hedge. Um, mm -hmm. If it's you're talking like waiting too long otherwise. I see. Okay, so that's what you mean by the exhaust is the stuff you just can't match uh, match internally. Exactly. You have to yeah. Go to the go yeah. to the venue, and so that. Yeah. So then, for areas like so in the FX market or or the treasury, like where there's very little that's going to an exchange, then how is the is the pricing on the exchange then that accurate? Like, if the flow was all put on a lit venue, but like. And it's done in a way that there wasn't information like like how 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 much disparity is there then between OTC pricing and what you see on a on a lit venue? Maybe we can end it there. I realize we're we're a little over time. No, so there's um there's there's a couple mechanisms that keep that price reasonably in check. Uh, mm -hmm. The first is the spot to futures market. So you're going to have futures that at least in FX that um people have to trade on an exchange. So there's there's some portion of of people that basically are going to see the futures market and then they're going to see the um, uh, they're going to see the the spot market on an exchange, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to arbitrage to keep those in line. So that becomes a good proxy. And the second is that in FX anyway, what's called the primary venues for they're all owned by this interbank consortium. So even though the banks and the large OTC providers don't deal a lot on, um, uh, on the exchange, they all have a stake in the exchange mm -hmm. and they all require, they, they need some benchmark, right? In order to, to price OTC. Mm -hmm. So they all have a big stake and then they all basically use the exchange primarily for data collection. Mm -hmm. So the exchange's business model now shifts to being more of like a uh, data collection. So everyone now has an incentive to quote the right prices onto these exchanges um, because that's the primary mechanism for price discovery. Interesting. And they effectively align the, they align the pricing mechanism for their data such that if you have what's called your maker taker ratio. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you are, um, you need to basically provide good pricing as a maker 
Otherwise, you're not going to get good data back. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like your incentive as a market maker basically is that I need to, I can't just be a taker, right? Meaning I'm, I'm, I only use it when I need to. I need to also make good prices into the exchange. Um, and if I don't do that, then I don't get access to the fastest data feed and the fastest you know, information and therefore oh, my okay. own pricing that I use to mm -hmm. make money everywhere else is shit. So, and that's why you see like in TradFi, a lot of the exchanges don't make, like their primary source of money is not, is not fees mm -hmm. on transactions. It's more data costs. Interesting. Because in an OTC world, the shifting incentive really more is along the lines of like, how do I give market makers the incentive to give accurate quotes such that my data is worth money to market makers rather than being the primary place where people actually trade. Trade. That's so fascinating how much that's evolved. It's very cool. Very cool. And so are your, is your hunch then, Carlos, that this is the same evolutionary track for the DeFi space, or do you feel like it's a little too early to tell? Um, Cause that's gonna be a pretty big divergence if it does follow that path to the current state of the market right now. My, my hunch is that in, in a, a long-term state of the world, <clears throat> Um, centralized exchanges are going to go away, hmm. or at least they're not going to become as important, um, in terms of like everyday, you know, like liquidity, mm -hmm. um, like there's, there's no, there's no reason, for example, for Coinbase to have one exchange where retail people go and more institutional people go and to charge such a different disparity in, in like fees between retail people and institutional people. I think that's probably going to go away. Um, and I think that, uh, for centralized exchanges, there will always be those centralized exchanges, but they're probably, and it, it, Coinbase could be the person that does this, but whoever corners the market on large institutional players dealing as like the primary exchange venue, that's going to be the place where I think like the centralized exchanges are going to live. Mm -hmm. But there's not going to need to be so many fragmented centralized venues because there's no point. There's yeah. just going to be a couple key ones per market that people use for what's called price discovery. And, you know, at the moment, I'd probably say it's going to be someone like, you know, Coinbase, yeah. probably not Binance because of all the regulatory problems. Mm -hmm. um, so probably Coinbase and then maybe like an incumbent like SIBO or CME or NASDAQ or whatever will develop, um, you know, one that's like explicitly for large institutions okay. and that will become important as well. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, uh, I think the DeFi side actually gets really interesting because I can see DeFi um, taking a huge role just because of the way that it does liquidity. But the problem, the main problem that you have with DeFi right now is that everything is immediately discoverable and that's not particularly great. So I'm actually personally looking for, um, and this, this would be a hard thing because this is technology that is not yet to hit and then also technology that could also use for bad purposes. Mm -hmm. So I would actually like to see ZK rollups or some sort of anonymous, um, anonymizing feature, be able to obfuscate the economic details of transactions on chain, but still mm -hmm. allow me to deal on chain. Mm. Now the U S has basically said, this is really bad already because they've made things like tornado cash, you know, <laughs> illegal to use. So it might be that you actually need like a KYC layer two, right? Um, that can verify that people are who they say they are. And then you have like a ZK roll up built into that such that once I verified that everyone here is KYC and, you know, not doing shitty things, then the individual details of their transaction are still obfuscated so that they can deal in such a way that allows them to do the size they need to. Right. Um, but that just doesn't exist yet. But I think there's lots of really interesting things you could do on chain to make that, to make that work. Um, you just need to find novel ways, both from a technology and a regulatory, you know, sign off perspective yeah. to get it to do so. Um, because that is to me, I think one of the, the main issues, I think DeFi is really set up well to handle retail and small institutional flow, but I don't think DeFi is really going to handle real institutional flow just quite yet because it doesn't solve the problem of being able to deal discreetly. Cool, guys. That's uh, fascinating. I would love to get into this a little bit more. I'm sure we're going to be touching on this in future podcasts, but the evolution of uh, the OTC market maker space is definitely going to be one that we'll be hitting on future episodes. Thanks, boys. And any parting words before we, uh, we head on? I know we went a little over time. 
Uh, good, good, live long and prosper. Yeah, live long and prosper. <laughs> I, love I, love it. It. I love it. I love it. I love it. The voice. Thanks a lot. This is great. I love it. Later, right. guys. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.